Anyway, okay, so nerve, end of nerve, axon of nerve, next nerve. Okay, and I draw it as a square. There's a space, and that space is called the synapse. Okay, this is not a hard concept, but it has a, a lot, a lot of importance for understanding exactly how the nervous system works. Okay, so you understand, or maybe you don't yet quite, but you kind of get the idea of how a nerve gets an impulse down it. Like going from one here to from here to this upper nerve is not a, it's, you can see how that would happen. Okay, the problem is, is that weird. There's a space between every nerve. Okay, and you have to start working. And the space between each nerve has to be, that gap has to be crossed. And the thing that crosses that gap is something called a neurotransmitter. Okay, neurotransmitters are chemicals. And we're going to look at a couple in a little bit of detail in a little bit. So, we talked, I think, a while ago in this class, or at least in the immune system, we talked about antigens and antibodies. How does anything in the body recognize that it's getting a signal? Well, a cell has to have on the surface of it receptors that match that chemical. Okay, so this cell is called the presynaptic nerve because it's before the synapse. What do you think that one's called? Postsynaptic. Okay. The presynaptic nerve sends out the neurotransmitter. The postsynaptic nerve has receptors on it for neurotransmitters. Okay. And so if this cell squirts out a neurotransmitter and it sticks in a receptor, that starts an action potential in the next nerve. That tells the next nerve to send a message. Does that make a little sense a little bit? Kind of. Don't reply if you don't want. So if we take a look at this animation a minute. Let me turn up the volume. Axon terminal is the end. <laughs> this obviously happens much faster than they're showing. Ain't that right, Sam? The membrane of the vesicle fuses with the membrane of the axon terminal, enabling the vesicle to release its contents into the synaptic space. The molecules released from the vesicle are chemicals called neurotransmitters. They drift across the synaptic space and bind to special proteins called receptors on the postsynaptic. This is way closer than it shows. Okay, we're talking, yeah, microns. All right, not inches. Neurons. The binding of a neurotransmitter to its receptor can trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. That electrical signal then moves toward the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. Electrochemical. Now that the neurotransmitter has relayed its message, it releases from the receptor into the synaptic space. Some of the neurotransmitter is degraded by enzymes in the synaptic space, and some of the neurotransmitter is carried back into the presynaptic neuron through transport of proteins. The neurotransmitter that is taken back up into the presynaptic neuron is then repackaged into vesicles that can be released the next time an action potential reaches the axon terminal. The entire process repeats each time an action potential reaches the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. Uh, the simplest nerve pathway is called the reflex arc. And you are testing a reflex arc or testing reflex arc in your uh, lab. Okay, here's our reflex hammer hitting reflex hammer hitting the kneecap and making your leg twitch. A reflex arc has three parts. Sensory nerve, 
Enter to run, motor nerve. That's it. All this other stuff is meaningless. Okay? There are two synapses. One from sensory to interneuron, one from inter to motor neuron. So if you think about it, a reflex, you don't think about it, right? When your kneecap gets hit, your leg just moves on its own. True? Doesn't move on its own, though. Where is the integration happening? Where is the integration happening? Where is the decision to kick the leg happening? Not in your brain. That's the key. This reflex right here is called a spinal reflex. A spinal reflex is a reflex that happens because the interneuron is in the spinal cord. There's no conscious, your brain is not in charge. It doesn't have to travel all the way up to your brain and back. It could never do it that quick. If it had to do that, you'd hit it and then there'd be a kick like a second later, half a second later. Okay, and instead, kick boom. <laughs> Has anybody tested the Achilles reflex yet? That's a spinal reflex. Okay? Remember, Julian, just a little blurb about neurotransmitters. You actually have two kinds of neurotransmitters, essentially. You have neurotransmitters that can excite a nerve and neurotransmitters that can inhibit an impulse. I'm going to show you an example of this. I'm going to show you an example of this with a little animation here in a minute. Excitatory neurotransmitters increase the permeability of the next nerve, of the, this of the postsynaptic nerve, to sodium ions. So they make it easier, they stimulate an action potential. Inhibitory neurotransmitters limit the action potential. So GABA is released from a nerve, and it can be either excitatory or inhibitory, depending on which receptor is active, for lack of a better way to say it. Let's look at an example of why you would need inhibitory neurotransmitters and how they work together. Uh, this is a pretty interesting animation about a disease which you may have heard of. I'll let it go. I love the word retrograde. It just anyway. Signals by excitatory neurons are often combined with signals by inhibitory neurons. The two competing signals may cancel each other out, reducing the number of excitatory signals that reach the muscle fiber, and thereby modulating the force of muscle contraction. Okay, so in other words, when you go to, let's say, throw a ball, you do all this stuff in some kind of smooth motion. The reason it's smooth is your brain is sending excitatory signals to contract your bicep, right, and pull the ball back, but you don't like to snap your bicep. It's not like this, right? It smoothly contracts. And the reason it smoothly contracts is because you're getting this kind of, okay, this one contract, this one not, this one this, one this, one this, one. You get it to do it right. Okay? If I wanted to quick knock this off the table, I'm going to contract my tricep muscle explosively all at once. Right? So I'm going to boom, knock that point off the table. Right? But I don't always want to contract my tricep muscle explosively all at once. And so I have 
this modulating or this, I don't know what the other word would be, that's a synonym of that, but controlling effect of muscle contraction. Okay? Oh, they're talking about tetanus. Have you heard of it? You get shots for this. Tetanus is caused by a gram positive spore forming bacillus called Clostridium tetani. C. tetani spores are commonly found in soil and enter the body through wounds. Tectonic tissue provides the anaerobic environment required for germination. Growing vegetative cells release a potent exotoxin called tetoplasmin. So hold on a second. So why is stepping on a rusty nail considered bad? Well, you poke a hole in your skin, drive these bacteria into your skin, and now the air can't get in there. They only live where there's no air. Okay, this is kind of an aside, but it puts it all together. Okay, so now these bacteria are living in there, and they're releasing this exotoxin, which is literally something they release as poisonous to you. Like viruses, they, your motor nerves are uh, tricked to take them in, just like they're taking in a neurotransmitter. That means opposite. Now this goes into some kind of great gory detail about it. So I'll let it tell you this. And what happens when that happens in tetanus? That's actually a painting done of a guy, of course, faded out in a perfect spot. But... This is what people used to have when they got tetanus. This is what they would look like. This arching of the back. That can't be very nice to have. That's why you don't want tetanus. Now, of course, today we have antibiotics and things like that that we can use to control it. But if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, so yes, this it's basically a contraction of every muscle in your body, okay, and the back muscles and butt muscles being strong enough to make you arch up like that. And I thought that was kind of cool. The next thing you need to understand is that neurons don't just work. Neurons don't just work by themselves. You can have convergence, where many neurons converge on one. Convergence, where many neurons converge on one neuron. Okay? And you can have divergence, where one neuron synapses with a whole bunch of different ones. Now, if you think about that, you can, now you can have millions and millions and millions a nerve cell doesn't just connect with another nerve cell in the brain. In the brain, a nerve cell can connect with lots of different nerve cells. Okay, so it's just called convergence and divergence, and I don't know that that's hard to remember. Okay, convergence can come together, divergence can separate, essentially. Uh, your spinal cord, and I think most people know what the spinal cord looks like. There is gray matter right down the middle of the spinal cord. That's where all the integrative parts are. The white matter on the outside is myelinated nerve fibers. Your spinal cord has 31 segments. One, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. Okay. And I'll show you a picture of this in a minute that enervate a different section of the body. Spinal cord is covered by meninges, same as the brain. We'll come back to this part. We we'll talk about the brain. By meninges and cerebral spinal, cerebral spinal fluid, which we'll talk about when we come back to the brain. Talk about the brain. Picture of a human, and what it's showing you is what each segment of the spinal cord enervates. Okay, so. Uh, the spinal cord, remember, if we go back to this slide a second, here are all the branches of nerves. The top eight are called cervical nerves. The middle 12 are called thoracic nerves. The next five are called lumbar nerves for the vertebrae. And then you have down here sacral nerves, okay, which innervate the sex organs in the, especially in the back of the legs. Okay, so for example, let's say somebody breaks the most common break is that between cervical vertebrae 4 and cervical vertebrae 5. Okay, so somebody breaks their neck here. They snap their spinal cord. That means now they have no feeling from there down. Because any message coming from here is going up there. Okay, if you have an itch on your back right down here, that sensation of itching is coming in T11 right there. And that nerve is the one that's sending it to your brain. Does that make any sense? So you can, a, 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 neuro, a neurologist can kind of map out, let's say you're having, let's say you're having back, somebody's having, um, you know, you ever hear of somebody having uh, leg pain with a bad back? Right? Why is that? Well, look, if they have a, let's say they have a slip disc right here at lumbar four, okay? That nerve runs all the way down their leg. That nerve is here. So that's the nerve that's being stimulated by the back pressure. Your brain recognizes it as the leg. Right? Because that nerve runs all the way down the leg. The arm. So when I, uh, my brother in law fell off his roof. He has, this part of his calf muscle doesn't work anymore on his left side. Well, you can trace that right up to when he landed, he fell back on his rear end and damaged that nerve right there on his left side, S1, specifically. So his calf muscle on that side is all atrophied and he's shrunk, essentially, because now that nerve doesn't send any messages either way. So someone who's a paraplegic has their back broken somewhere down here. So all these messages don't get to the brain, but they can move all this part just fine. Does that make any sense? And so when you go to the, if you ever have to go to the neurologist and they do all these tests like touch ball or an SCP, you feel it, they're actually testing your spinal cord too. All the nerve messages traveling in your spinal cord and all that. Are there any questions about that? It's called nerve intelligence. 